Coming up next, the spookening reads The Mask of the Red, or should I say Dead Death? <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's me, your humble and obedient ghost, welcoming you to Halloween week. Because you're too weak to run from the ghouls and goblins (laughs) that are going to get you. Brandon, you are. Do you remember your Halloween name? Are you proud of it? Uh, Brandon Chest Fiend. (laughs) You're Brandon Chest Fiend. That's right. (laughs) Our listeners must be so scared right now. (laughs) I hope you're not listening to this in the middle of the fright. (laughs) I love Halloween, folks. The kitschier and more terrible, (laughs) or more, should I say, more (laughs) scarable, the deader. Hey, it's Jacob Menskiller, <laughs> the pastor, who's a master of bleeding. <laughs> I just, I just, I'm the guy who is lying on the floor bleeding in the horror film. Yeah, maybe the master of making someone else bleed. I don't know. It, it could be taken to... It, you could be the agent of bleeding or the agent who's bleeding. I, I, either way. Guys, we should explain what we're doing. People are getting a bookening episode on Monday? Yeah. What's with that? Well, it's Halloween week. It's yeah. Halloween week, and we wanted to do a bunch of Halloween store, Halloween gories, yeah, short gories, yeah. And so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do one a day. You got your Monday, your Tuesday, your Wednesday, your Thursday, your die day, and we're gonna do a story each day, a classic tale of terror. This so so these episodes are gonna be a little shorter, but you're gonna get five of them. So. I guess you could wait until Wednesday and build up kind of a, a cache of booking if you want like a bigger burst or wait till Friday and you'll have like the length of an entire episode, maybe a quite a big episode. I don't know. But you're just going to get a little bit of booking each day. Don't worry. We're not always going to do this, but we thought it would be fun to do this for Halloween. We just thought we'd start with the greatest horror writer guy of all time, Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. And his illimitable classic. The Mask of the Red Death. All right. <laughs> Mask of the Red Death. Brandon, you are the contextual Texan. I dead, am. Dead son. The contextual dead son. Yeah. And you needed to, that. you you are uh, from the great state of Texas. You are going to tell us some much needed context about this work by Edgar Allan Poe and all that stuff. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the first time we've talked about Poe. Mm-hmm. And most of these guys, at least Poe and Hawthorne, were a bit... Of contemporaries, Poe was a little bit before Hawthorne, but they were both uh, New Englanders. Have we announced who we're doing yet, or is that supposed to be a surprise each episode? Yeah, why don't we announce it? We're going to do Poe, we're going to do Mask of the Red Death, we're going to yeah. do Hawthorne, uh, what's Young the name? Young Goodman Brown. Young Goodman Brown. We're going to do Algernon Blackwood, The Willows, personal favorite of mine. Me we're going. Too. We're going to do, yeah, it's really good. We're going to do H.P. Lovecraft's The Outsider. Not such a favorite, but it's nice to do something by Lovecraft. He deserves a little shout out. And we are going to do... Shredney Vashter by the incomparable Saki or Saki, however you say that. Saki. H. H. Monroe. (laughs) Yeah. Brandon is right to uh, maybe double up a little bit and talk about Hawthorne. Poe wrote that really famous review of a collection of Hawthorne stories. Like they were contemporaries enough that Poe reviewed him. Yeah. So Hawthorne's first book tells, what was it called? Twice Told Tales. Twice Told Tales. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) And that's actually because Poe, before he was known as a writer, was primarily known as a literary critic. Mm -hmm. He was very well respected as a critic, and especially one of his favorite targets was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He would make quite a bit of fun of of Longfellow. I like him already. Yeah. and But he was a very discerning critic, and he's also famous for uh, especially two essays, which are widely read. I read one of them in graduate school. There's one where he traces the composition of the raven. Yeah, that's and the talks philosophy about the singularity of composition. Of effect. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good essay for writers yeah. and creatives to read. It's, um, it's interesting and helpful. So he has the unity effect, unity of effect in that theory, where he says that it should all resonate together, and you should have things like tone, theme, setting, character. Mm-hmm. These should all be unified. And so he was a great critic. He understood how things should work. He also believed that things should be short whenever possible, mm-hmm. which that definitely fits with the Red Death, right? 
And then he also believed that, which may be surprising for people who read a lot of Poe, he did not believe that writing was just a spontaneous act, but it should be very methodical and analytical. Hmm. And then (laughs) T.S. Eliot later would do the famous smackdown on him where he said, well, if only Poe had taken his advice more seriously. (laughs) 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 But maybe his poetry would have been better. (laughs) So Poe was born in 1809. He was the child of two actors. (laughs) That's not surprising at all. No, it's not surprising. It sounds like I was being sarcastic, no. but I was not being sarcastic. No, he he seems like the type that would be the child of actors. Pretty theatrical. Self-important, yeah, melodramatic. Very theatrical, very melodramatic. Both of his parents died when he was young. Mm-hmm. And then he was taken in by a family. I had their names written down. Oh, the Allens in Richmond, Virginia. And so he was an orphan. He was the son of these two actors. And he was estranged from his foster family later in life because of gambling debts Mm -hmm. that he incurred, gambling, and also debts that he incurred failing out of the uh, University of Virginia. When University of Virginia was a young school, he was one of the first to go there. He studied ancient languages. And so he was always, he was just an unreliable drunkard. He tried to go to West Point and he failed out. So he wanted to have a military career as well. So that was just the pattern of who he was as a young man up Mm -hmm. until about when The Raven was published, which would have been in 1845, which brought him instant success. So he has this whole period of his life. What is that? 36 years or so? Raven published 45. That would be three years before he he died, if you're paying attention. And so it's a very brief period of his life where he he actually has literary fame. But he's... Interesting character because he's kind of, he's the stereotype of what everybody thinks that the tortured artist is like. He was an alcoholic. He was depressed. His death was mysterious. Some people think maybe it was an STD, maybe a brain disorder. Some think he committed suicide. It's really unclear what happened to him. But he also had a tormented love life as well. He married his 13-year-old cousin, Virginia Clem. But she died like two years after the raven uh, became successful, and then he died like two years after that. And so it's a very short, tumultuous life that he had. But yeah, he's now, he's kind of like the poster child of what everybody imagines the American writer must be like. Mm-hmm. And so people like Fitzgerald and Steinbeck, those guys who kind of modeled themselves on Poe because they wanted to be what you need to be. We, they wanted to live the life you need to live in order to be a great writer. It's always interesting tracing the mythos of what it, of what we think genius needs to be. Mm-hmm. Because you wonder, is that the kind of man that makes these works? Or is it because one man lived that kind of life, everybody then thinks they need to be like him. And so they try to live that way. Yeah, I always think of the movie Moulin Rouge, where Ewan McGregor plays a struggling writer. And the way they choose, and that movie's all about iconography and these quick snatch images and stuff. And the way they choose to portray the writer is a guy in a wife beater with grizzled hair, a bottle of booze next to a typewriter. His hat pushed back on his His head. His hat pushed back on his head, greasy hair. And that's Boz Lerman. Just, he loves that because that's exactly what he did with Great Gatsby. That's right. He made Nick into that guy, Mm -hmm. which was pretty lame. But yeah, it's it's a myth. And a lot of Edgar Allan Poe's life is mixed with this sort of mythology because it's early 1800s. We don't know just a whole lot about him. We know what he was like through his writings. We know that he was into morbid, depressed, dark things, because all his stories are morbid, depressed, and dark. Mm -hmm. His poetry is usually morbid, depressed, and dark. One of his first works that he published was Tamerlane and Other Poems in 1827. So that would have been, he was fairly young when he published that. That's, what, 16? But that wasn't a success immediately, and it wasn't really until The Raven in 1845 that he really found brief and momentary success, but he burned through all his money. He still wasn't happy. Like I said, he died in Baltimore at 1849 at age 40. And that's really his life. It's a kind of a short, sad, depressing life. There's a rumor that he may have had a love affair with someone before he moved off to college as well. And that might've been part of the fight that he had with the Allens. And so his life is just mixed with, it, it's unclear. Right. But there are other things to say about him because he, he's a strange character. Like I said, he was known mainly as being a literary critic and he has had a afterlife as having a pretty heavy influence on especially like romantic and then American literature with those two major essays. The first would have been, like you said, that one on the philosophy of composition and Mm -hmm. the other, the poetic principle. Have you read that one? Yeah, I've read both of those and they're they're worth reading. I would encourage people to send out their good essays. The poetic principle is the one, isn't it, where he says the poem should be written for the poem's sake. And that's where he again argues against the short poem. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, a poem should be written for a poem's sake. In other words, 
that he's part of the art for arts movement mm -hmm. that would have been very famous during that. And he kind of has helped to spearhead that. Even though he didn't cause the movement, he was very popular, even more popular than he was in America. He was very popular in Europe. Part of the reason was because a lot of his essays would translate very well. And also his short stories and his poems translate into French very well. And so he, he kind of had an afterlife in France where he became kind of a literary hero over there. Yeah. Harold Bloom, who just died sadly, yeah. had a thing he liked to say about Poe, which is that he, he, he said he read much better in translation, even into English. Somebody had taken Baudelaire's translation and translated it back into English. And Bloom was like, well, if you got to read Poe, which you, why would you bother? But if you must, then the way to read him is that way. Is translated into French. And, and then, then translation back, back into English back. By, by someone that's, with more taste than Poe. That's really interesting. Yeah. Translated up twice. That so. is a quintessentially Harold Bloomian opinion right there. Yeah. Good old Bloom. Good old Bloomy. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, art for art's sake. Yeah, yeah. And then the translations into French. And so he had this weird, like I said, afterlife in France and in Europe where he became pretty famous over there, more famous than he was in America at the time. I guess it's very similar to, was it David Hasselhoff? Who's Being famous in huge Germans. Germany. <laughs> or like Woody, Woody Allen, a famous yeah. debauched American, still has purchase. Like nobody in America cares about him, but in Europe, he can still get films financed and he can still get them shown. Roman Polanski, same thing. Yeah. So 1809, 1849, that puts him strongly in the romantic and gothic traditions. Mm -hmm. So if people want to know more about that, they can go and listen to our episodes on Mary Shelley. Mm -hmm. Just so people kind of a quick refresher romantics they were a strong they were a re reaction against the classical uh models of the 1700s and so they really emphasized emotion and feeling and um instinct and so like if i remember right his poetic principle even though he was for the methodical creation of a poem and structuring of a poem he still thought that the poem in the end was like its main purpose was aesthetic in other words it got got for the feelings mm -hmm. Through image. And part of that's because he was strongly reacting against transcendentalism, which was on the rise at the time, which good for him there. Transcendentalism was just idiotic. But romanticism and especially this sort of darker romanticism, like with the Gothic movement, where he would have, that would have been his bent. Mm -hmm. And so, which would put him squarely with guys like, uh, with, well, with Hawthorne, as we'll mm -hmm. find out. And, but the other thing with Poe is that. He, since he was so obsessed with this idea of make it short, he kind of was a revolutionary or at least someone who experimented with a short story before the short story was really a thing. Mm -hmm. And so he would tell these tales and Hawthorne would as well. But Poe, especially most of his career was built around either these short poems or these short stories that he would write these. He wouldn't have called them short stories, I don't think, but more like tales. And um, the other thing that he would have brought in, added into it were these elements of the sort of new strange science that was happening. So as the scientific movement was taking off, and we see this with Frankenstein as well, which was around the same time as Poe, this thought of if science, if so science can also, science can progress, but science can then also get into these transgressive areas. And so Poe was very interested in that, in the weird psychology, the weird phenomenology. I think he got into cryptography as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was pretty influential in cryptography. So he was into these weird sciences and especially for their aesthetic effect, which would then give his stories their peculiar color and flavor. So like you have the pit and the pendulum, mm -hmm. for example, the raven with the ominous bird symbol. Mm -hmm. Also his, his penchant for horror would lead him into, he's a, a he's very popular with psychological criticism or yeah. psychoanalytical criticism which I think is pretty clear as why, because heavy symbolism, things dealing with death and guilt that lend itself to sort of psychoanalytical uh, interpretations, which I think easily transitions, transitions us into this story mm -hmm. because this is a heavy, very heavily symbolical story. It is at that. Yeah. <laughs> the story I don't know what else there what is to the, really say about it. What do you think the red death stands for? Uh, what do you think the mask stands for? The Red Power Ranger. The red, probably the Red Power Ranger. Yeah, Poe was ahead of his time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Saban was behind his time. Uh, that's a nice poll. I know who made Power Rangers. I, I will add three things, Brandon. Number yeah. one, I don't think we, we can go without saying that Poe invented the detective story as we know it. I mean, yes, Doyle was just shamelessly doing Poe's formula with Sherlock Holmes. It's all there in. 
the Purloin Letter in, what is it called, The Golden Beetle. There's a number of stories featuring, what is his name, Dupin. I don't know. This is all off the top of my head. Yeah. Poe invented it. You like CSI? You like any of that stuff? Edgar Allan Poe came up with it. It's his thing. And this isn't like a hoity-toity, well, he kind of invented No, he actually just came up with the formula. Number two, I think in terms of the history of supernatural literature, horror literature, that kind of stuff, he brought psychology to it. And that is why the, what did you Psycho-critical? say? Psychocritical? Psycho- Psychoanalytical. Psychoanalytics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why they're interested in him. But if you yeah. think about the classic creature stories, it's all sort of outside of us. The Even the gothic strain, you know, it'd be like some evil baron or something like that, you know, keeping a maiden in his castle. But Poe is the telltale heart. I mean, nobody had ever done anything like that before. Getting inside the head, what, what would actually make someone go insane? Yes. What would make okay. somebody bury someone under the floorboards? <laughs> Getting into that dark psychology, it's all new. So we have, we also have Poe to thank for Seven and Silence of the Lambs. And yes, that's true. I didn't talk about his heavy influence on American art culture. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say the literary scene, but that's I mean, in movies, everything, right? So. But he cheap, did cheap stuff from the 60s where they all would draw from Poe. Well, and I would also say in terms of his artistic influence, you can't underrate the fact that he is iconic. Like, I mean, his image is literally, yeah. it's one that we know. It's one that can go on t-shirts and posters. It's like Che Guevara. It's like John Lennon. It's like Marilyn Monroe. Edgar Allan Poe is somebody who simply stands for a whole school of literature and a whole school of thought and a whole way of approaching the world. I mean, he is, you go into hot topic right now, you can, you'll find Jack Skellington. You might find Edgar Allan Poe. You might have a little harder time finding Edgar Allan Poe than you will Jack Skellington, but he is a symbol that people eat gothic emo teenage idiots of a, or whatever they're called now. I don't know if emo is a word that we use anymore, but whatever they're called, Edgar Allan Poe is one of their, one of their guys. It's a baggage, Gaggage, do you guys bring to Edgar Allan Poe? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've I've read some Poe in my time. Brennan, same question. I've read some Poe in my time. No, so I remember reading him when I was maybe. So I got a book of his stories. I think in my grandfather's house, and I read Telltale Tell Heart, and was so maybe it was twelve or thirteen. Mm-hmm. I was excited by it. It was like, this is something weird and something I'm not supposed to be reading. And then I remember reading The Pit and the Pendulum and it actually made me feel sick. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the gut reaction I've always had with Poe and things like this is it gives me, it makes me nauseous. Hmm. I don't, I don't like it because it gets me this actual visceral reaction that I don't find appealing. Do you, do you have a harder time reading about grisly stuff than you do watching a movie of it? I do. But you even know that I don't care a whole lot for slasher stuff. I, I do. I'm not trying yeah. to accuse you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's accusing you of having a weak stomach. Yeah. No, no, no. I was just curious. <laughs> it's interesting to me. I don't actually. I don't actually ever vomit or anything. Right. Yeah, I this know. Stuff, but I just, it turns. I don't know that an idea usually, like I've, I, I'll see certain images or things that yeah. will make me sick, but to actually just have something described like, oh no, there's rats crawling over him. Um, I'm sorry. That's not not so much what it is. It's just, it's, it's the thought of it that makes me not necessarily sick. It's almost like it turns my stomach in a knot. Hmm. It's like I said, it's a weird visceral reaction and I've always had it to Poe, especially. That's interesting. He is suffocating. I mean, and, and it's the effect of all the verbs and adjectives and everything as much as anything. He just feels heavy. Yeah. The telltale heart. That's what I remember reading more than anything else. And, you know. The pounding of the heartbeat. The vulture eye. I mean, he's... Louder and louder and louder. Yeah, he's good at taking those images that are terrifying. Like the old man's vulture eye. Mm -hmm. The um, moss and the calcium deposits on the walls and the cask of Amontillado Mm -hmm. from all the wet drippings and stuff. He's he's really good at the visceral, like I said, the... The giant swinging pendulum. I mean, who comes up with that and how? I've, I've said this on the booketing before, but... I remember distinctly, I remember I had a book for homeschool called Elements of Literature in fourth or fifth grade. I took, I was a nerd that liked to read the book for fun. I had the book in my bedroom. One night I stumbled across the telltale heart. I didn't know who it was. Maybe I knew the name Edgar Allan Poe and knew that he was transgressive and cool and interesting somehow, but I just started reading and I had no idea what I I was in for. And I was 
absolutely terrified. It was so scary. I think I had to tell my parents it was like one of those like wake up dad kind of moments. Like there was no, there was no getting over it. There was no, you know, I, I, I couldn't hide it. I had to, I had, I felt like I had stumbled into something really cool and transgressive, but also just like terrifying really scary yeah it's fascinating because that story is scary i guess but it's not it's not the first kind of thing that would scare me now actually you know like you're not scared that a monster is going to get the guy or that the supernatural exists he just he just kills somebody and then the guilt and the beating of the terrible heart but somehow that idea was just nasty enough to me or scary enough mm-hmm. that i remember it's maybe the only piece the single piece of literature i've read that has actually scared me i'll watch certain horror movies and they will actually affect me viscerally like i will i'll cover my eyes or i won't want to look but i have never had a piece of writing actually make me feel or you know they can make me feel suspense they can make me feel all kinds of things but to actually be scared like i need to put this book down because i have a creeping tingling sensation that something's sneaking up on me or something i've never had a book do that to me and around poe did it and it felt really intense and i was really scared and i really didn't like it but i was also attracted to it and i wanted more so i went to the library and got a book (laughs) called the raven i think i don't know what the book was called but it had the monkey's paw by whoever wrote the monkey's paw and the raven and uh sleepy hollow and all those kinds of really classic probably young goodman brown was in there and that was actually my my entry into the wonderful world of horror so it's all so it was the telltale heart that telltale heart did it gateway drug it was the gateway drug yeah took it interesting that that is the one that we all read as kids that we remember and know i think it tends yeah. to be anthologized about as much as anything yeah i'm not sure why that is that or the stupid cask of amontillado or however you say that which i i never cared about as a kid and now uh, people really love that one and to me it's neither scary nor interesting I just, I never cared. Oh, he walled the guy in. That's too bad. I don't get it. But that's just my two cents. Well, the Mask of the Red Death. What'd you guys think about the Mask of the Red Death? Were you able to sleep last night after you read it? (laughs) Oh, barely. I haven't haven't slept since I read it. Which was like, what, an hour ago or something like that? (laughs) Something like that, yeah. Me me neither, Nathan. (laughs) One of the things I liked a lot about the story... Wow, this is unexpected. Um, was it the end? Okay. No, Nathan it was like five minutes after the end. Once I had forgotten <laughs> about it, it participates in this horror of place mm-hmm. really well. So I'm thinking of like what I really like about the magician's nephew when they go to Charn. Charn, mm-hmm. the weird his this place that has a history that that seems to have this deep meaning to it that mm-hmm. you still can't completely figure out and it's that's part of the horror is just the weirdness of the place yeah and so in charn it's the eyes it's the statues and the old ancient town that has this whole this history behind it that the kids don't know about here it's this building that this guy has created with these weird windows and the colors and it's supposed to be like a party house Mm -hmm. but the way well and it's all walled in and they welded it and bolted yeah, the gates. And right. In an attempt to keep out the Red Death. Right. <laughs> which they don't. <laughs> they don't. Nope. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. They fail. <laughs> but I like that sort of thing. I like it when you have these weird buildings. I think it's because I, we've talked about nightmares that we've had before. Mm-hmm. I think we all have these dreams where mine was that I would be in the old First Baptist Church where I grew up, which is this huge building, and I'd be walking at night with my dad, and then suddenly he'd disappear, and I'd be walking these long hallways that would just extend forever. And I would always somehow end up in the baptismal area mm-hmm. and I'd be looking, but the, like the, it was going to be like a cathedral ceiling and these weird stained glass windows everywhere and it'd be late at night and just this feeling of being watched. Mm-hmm. I think maybe that's part of what it is as well. Mm-hmm. Like there's some presence or the building itself has a presence, some malevolence to it. That's, yeah. I like it. It's, I think that's one of the successes of the story. Well, it is th- literally one thing happens in this story. It's like a punchline with almost no setup. But the setup is just, here's the place that they were at. It's kind of cool and scary. Like, that's that's the story. I remember reading a, it was a fantasy horror sci-fi periodical, and they published a list of th- submissions they never wanted again. Like, we get these all the time. 
we do not want to see this story from writers. Please do not send these to, they will be rejected no matter how artful you think you are. We've seen it a million times. We do not want it. And it was interesting to read this list of rejected things. And one of them was a vampire or a werewolf or a monster stalks someone and they spend the whole time stalking them. And then at the end, it turns out that the person they were stalking is actually a werewolf or a monster or something even stronger than they, like they never wanted to see that again. There's just certain tropes that they were so tired of. Yeah. But one of them was, the author spends a long time describing an evocative, spooky place, and nothing happens. Yeah. So, they didn't like that. But Pokemon gets away with it. A, something does happen, but B, it's a really cool, evocative place. It is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. Why, whose idea was it to read this story? <laughs> Uh, I don't know, Nathan. <laughs> it's not mine. It's probably Jake. It's not like something Jake would make us read. Well, I don't know. Did you, it, so, did we hate this story? Did it not do anything for us? It was just a waste of time. Brandon liked the setting. I like the setting too. Uh, the castle with the rooms and you know the lights, colored lights and stuff. That was nice, I guess. But you know, it was only it was three pages long, mm -hmm. and if the setting is the setup, I don't understand. I mean, this is not much payoff. They all they all die. But there's a specter with a mask like the Red Death. They tried to keep the Red Death out, Jake. Here's the thing. People try and keep death out. Oh, wow. But it gets in. Oh, wow. Like the village. It's like the village. I'm so, you know, I did just the point had totally sailed over my head. Like you now. and all your hypocritical friends, you guys try and forget about death. But cool people oh, like me, Jake, like... who've read Edgar Allan Poe, we know. Death can't be held out. It will. Death, darkness, and decay, they will, all three of them, hold hold illimitable dominion over all of us. Like, Poe's actually illimitable getting at dominion. it, man. Like, Jake. He really gets it, doesn't he? Yeah. Your hand that you have, that you're spinning a pen with right now, it is going to rot into a skeleton hand. Eventually. And it's going to turn to maggot-eaten dirt. Well, I'm having a profound moment because of that where I'm now staring at my hand. I'll probably stare at it for the next hour. And you forget about that, my friend. You don't even think about it. But Edgar Allan Poe's like, he's so dark and he reminds you. He gets it. Yeah, he gets it. And therefore gets, well, not me because I. You know, no, he doesn't get you. You're like, you. you're just reveling in your blood bedewed hall yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Which room would you guys like to be in? Probably the blue room. Yeah, the blue room the sounds blue cool. The blue room is what I was thinking too. I don't know. I'm a big fan of purple and there are two purple rooms there's purple and there's a violet so depending yeah. on the shades purple might be fun you know right. i think i'd just go to the sable black oh, you just hang out in sable yeah. right in that that place you you couldn't handle the sable when that clock goes off and you're suddenly reminded brandon that time of your mortality tick tick ticking away tick tick ticking away that one day oh, well, i didn't get it the clock symbolizes mortality amazing and they're all wearing masks and they're wearing masks so they're not their real selves oh wow and it gets, sorry, did I do the east-west thing? No, you didn't, here, not on this. The, crap, somebody else has to do it because I'm playing the idiot. Oh, Jake, you don't even get it. Like, east, <laughs> wait, maybe I don't get it, let me think here. <laughs> Prince Prospero's in the very east part of the room, the phantasmagorical palace of death Wonders. or whatever. <laughs> Wonders. And when he follows the red death guy, he goes all the way through to the west like where the sun goes down like death like it's a symbol like he went the entire trajectory of his life whoa from east to west from east to west whoa so it's like starts in blue but then it ends in like black black and red yeah just like we all end in black and red and you go from whoa. east to west and as soon as he hits that room the west he he die, he falls down dead right there what's red and black all over everyone eventually Sunburn penguin. A sunburned penguin as well. <laughs> a newspaper. Yeah. A newspaper printed on black paper. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought this story was cool. Why do you guys want to make fun of it? It's fun. It's cool. Uh, I'm trying to find this quote. Um, pretty sure that... Yeah, here you go. Poe strongly disliked didacticism and allegory. Did he now? <laughs> <laughs> Though he believed that meaning in literature should be an undercurrent just beneath the surface. <laughs> huh. Just beneath of, the surface. Master the master of subtlety. Of subtlety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, you know. Wow. So I it's mean, like the current is the red death, but then right <laughs> under that, it actually stands for death. <laughs> See, because there are masks. Right. So. 
Oh, brother. <laughs> can you f- can you search and find on, a f- on an iPhone? Yes. I think I did. You, you, you search in a page. Just go to the yeah. search bar and search, and then you'll have a find on this page button. Yep. Keep going. What are you looking for? I was trying to find his quote on allegory. Oh, from Poe? Yeah. He doesn't like allegory or didacticism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like... Mask of the Red Death, and then slightly below it, in terms of allegory, comes Pilgrim's Progress. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing that really is like that sort of sophomoric, and I mean, sophomoric. Like a sophomore would come up with this. So, yes. well, the, I, I, I mean, the sophomore in high school would think that that is a really deep, right. short story, and that Poe quote about, or it, if it's a quote or not. Mm-hmm about how stupid allegory is and they wouldn't see any contradiction. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. They probably wouldn't. I think it's easy to make fun of this story because it is over the top and it has almost no effect on, you know, like we're not actually scared by it. But... Well, there you go. He defends go. allegory apparently in this as well. Oh, there you go. In defense of allegory, there is scarcely one respect... To, oh, never mind. <laughs> There's... <laughs> Defensive allegory. There is scarcely one respectable word to be said. (laughs) Its best appeals are made to the fancy, that is to say, to our sense of adaptation, not of matters proper, but of matters improper for the purpose, to the real with the unreal, having never more of an intelligible connection than has something with nothing, never half so much of effective affinity as has the substance for the shadow. The deepest emotion aroused within us by the happiest allegory, as allegory, is a very, very imperfectly satisfied sense of the writer's ingenuity. (laughs) Oh, there you go. So that apparently he thinks that allegory needs to be ju- judiciously subdued. Yeah. Okay. Is this judiciously subdued? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Can barely tell what it's what the allegory is. Yeah. It's definitely not in your face. Nope. It's not like the main character is called the Red Death. Nope. <laughs> yeah, or the prince is called the Prince Prospero. Yeah, because <laughs> he's prosperous. <laughs> yeah. That, oh, he thinks percent. he is. <laughs> yeah, he does. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. <laughs> Seen only as a shadow. Or by suggestive glimpses. There's yeah. shadows all over this thing. Well, there we go. I mean, it's the... full of shadows, so he's yeah, got that one. Like, over, red yeah. death stands for regular death. It's a suggestive <laughs> glimpse. <laughs> and making its nearest approach to truth in a not unobtr- in a not obtrusive and therefore not unpleasant appositeness. A-P-P-O, I mean, like a positive. Right. Meaning adjacent, too. Mm. So, so when the corpse shows up. Mm, yeah. Nothing but pleasant. Its feelings. approach to truth is definitely not obtrusive. He's not obtruding into anything. <laughs> no, he's just walking around, and then he walks to the west. Yeah. yeah I'm going to defend this thing. Okay, number one, you guys read this in the daylight hours with uh-huh. absolutely no hope that it would do anything to you, and without trying to get into the mood or give yourself to it at all, in order to just do it on a podcast. And now you're going to come and make fun of it. And yes, you're no, you're not wrong about anything. But this story is popular, just like all of Edgar Allan Poe is for a reason, because it does have an effect on people. It does work if you give yourself to it. If you read it late at night, it would probably this story might have worked on all of us if we'd read it at a certain point in our life. In, in our life. And have we grown beyond that? Sure. And is that a good thing? Sure. But do I begrudge someone thrilling to the Tale horse of the, and, the mask horse of, and his boy. No, no, I don't. Did I say I did? No, you did. I, I can be consistent with myself here. I'm not being inconsistent. That's a nice try, Jake. But <laughs> I'm glad people like the horse and the boy. And I just think all the little Nathans out there, you know, they don't need to be smug about it. Like you don't understand, man. Death is a thing. But it's nice to remember, especially when you're like we all are kind of getting to the age where we're a little creaky and we're starting to realize we're not going to live forever. When you're 16, you know, it's nice to read something that's just like, you're going to die, don't forget. It's kind of nice to be reminded of that in four pages. And yeah. it's a cool setting, and it's evocative. And if you give it to, you give yourself to it, you can get a, a Halloween spook from it, you know, get that delicious feeling of, ooh, this is kind of creepy, like watching a Twilight Zone or something like that. Edgar Allan Poe can do that. And he is being intentional. It's not like Edgar Allan Poe didn't know he was writing in a Baroque, quasi-biblical, over-the-top manner. A, that was more the style then anyway. B, he's piling up those adjectives because he thinks he can achieve his emotional effect that way. And for millions of readers, he has. So I say, fie upon your cynicism, bookening. One star. 
<laughs> Bring me Agatha Christie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Agatha Christie's. Call forth Dame be... Agatha Christie. <laughs> have her fetch Edgar Allan Poe's head on a plate. Yeah, well, I think it would be more likely that Edgar Allan Poe would come and bring Edgar, Agatha Christie's plate on. Oh, they'd be best friends. <laughs> they would love head. each other. <laughs> yeah. When we try to grab the plate, it disappears. <laughs> Ooh, she'd feed grapes to his head and he'd love it. And... Yeah, she'd feed grapes to his head and he'd love it. Yeah. All right, guys, reader, I hope we haven't ruined your Halloween. I'm going to come, I'm going to defend young Goodman Brown tomorrow. And I you know who didn't defend Young Goodman Brown? Who Hawthorne? No, 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 Poe. no, no Poe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's full of allegory, like he hates. <laughs> yeah, <obviously. laughs> he he said that uh, in that essay I just read, he was talking about Hawthorne. He says if he does, he gives himself too much to allegory, and if he doesn't stay, if he remains in that line of writing, he will never amount to much. <laughs> Wow. All right. Happy Halloween. Self-awareness, baby. You know what? We're going to spread the patrons out over these five episodes, so let's just call out a few of them. Okay. Booking patrons. Robert and Rhonda, the death birds. Ooh. That's, that's all we'll do. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> the hateful Anthony Goulder. Uh, ah. Yeah, we used to scream out. We used to ah! scream out. Yeah, <laughs> Little Anthony's Cigar Gore. Ah! Help me! The Immortal Vampire. Oh! Ah! <laughs> uh, Jimmy Bleed and Liddy, Little sp- Annie Spokely. She's impaled on a Spokely. What's a Spokely? Ah! <laughs> From a wheel. Or should I say squeal? <laughs> Uh, Just one more. <laughs> Lily of the Mallet Valley of Death. I don't know. Yeah, Valley of Death. That's great. <laughs> oh, Lily of the Mallet. Yeah, <laughs> people are quaking in their boots right now. A Lily of the Mallet. Bloody Mallet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. I'm sorry. I like Edgar Allan Poe. I don't really like him. <laughs> Just imagine this self-satisfied mic drop at the end of this. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? I, I just had so much fun. I got such a kick out of imagining him I like that putting his sentence. final period on yeah. this. On this. Oh, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Poe, you bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood bedewed halls of their revel and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that last, with that of the last of the gay. And the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay, and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Oh, Poe, you bad boy. (laughs) (laughs) Nailed it. (laughs) You did it again, (laughs) Poe. All right. Let your blood be on your own head, guys. I think there's probably some people that like Poe. Come on, Poe fans. Clap. Clap. We're supposed <laughs> to. Hey, we, back from the dead. <laughs> we have been told in the past that this is the guy that we probably go and read. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, Poe sucks. <laughs> Wait, what was that again? Remember we when we criticized Winnie the Pooh, somebody, we won't say who, oh, right. said... Oh, well, they can probably, now that they're done with Poe, they can get back to reading, or Mill. now that they're done with Poe, they can get back to reading their Edgar Allan Poe or whatever it is they like. Oh, my goodness. Because it's who we like. No, but I do think, guys, as much as I made fun of Agatha Christie, I always made space for people to like Agatha Christie. I didn't just, mm. Are you saying that the official booketing position is, mm. Towards Edgar Allan Poe. No, I mean, if someone wants to read Poe and they enjoy Poe, there's whatever. I, I think there could be harm and concern if Poe's your favorite. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying he should be your favorite. I'm not saying you, should, you need to live in the land of Poe your whole life. We've given lots of caveats about these kinds of things through the history of the bookening. But if somebody just wants to read this story on Halloween night and be like, ooh, that gave me a little spook, I, I really don't see what the problem is. Well, I feel like you could do... I don't know. It's been a while since I read Poe. I just feel like you could do do a better Poe story. A better Poe story. I Tell like Tale Heart is not bad. Telltale Heart is good. Cask of Amontillado is not bad. I don't like it, but that's fine. 
Okay. It's okay for you to be wrong sometimes, Brandon. It, Nathan's the only one that's allowed to pick the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the post stories that we don't like. Fine. That, that one's terrible, although it appears in the anthologies as much as the Telltale Heart. Yeah, Nate. But this one... <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I don't know. <laughs> Tune up on aisle five. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I, I. I don't have a problem with this story at all, except it just feels. I don't know. I feel like something I read, and what's there to say about it? <laughs> I like that he goes for a completely baroque, ridiculous operatic effect, and I think he pulls it off. If he wrote another page, it would be self-indulgent. But for a little four-page story that doesn't take that long to strive for a big effect, splashy effect like this, it's fine. I mean, how would you write the story of the Red Death? I wouldn't. (laughs) Yeah, I was yawning, but that's what I was trying to say. (laughs) I I sometimes gauge my artistic endeavors as to whether or not my life feels any more complete (laughs) because I have now had this experience. (laughs) I am reading a book currently where my life always feels more complete because I've had that experience. Mm -hmm. How many times have you read that book? This is going to be my seventh time. Is it a cookbook? Yes. Fatty? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is. And it's... it's Passive living. aggression yeah. over there. <laughs> it's, guess what? It's holding up. <laughs> Just like your belly is. <laughs> yeah. Do you make some fresh strawberry tarts? <laughs> <laughs> From your favorite book? <laughs> Oh, Nathan. All right, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. (laughs) Nathan's glad he did this. (laughs) Actually, I'm sad. (laughs) All right. The Spookening today was written by Nathan Alberson, and he's the only person we're giving credit to this episode. (laughs) Go to patreon.com forward slash the bookening to support great podcasts. (laughs) 